Welcome to season three of Locker Room for Growers, a show with human centric conversations that include compelling stories, unique professions, and those who set the tone for living with a positive attitude. I'm your host, Debbie Ellickson. Please subscribe to the show and check out our past episodes and clips. Follow me on YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, Threads, and more. Now let's meet our next guest. Under the musical imprint of Gista, Sean Self is a rapper, producer, record label owner whose journey includes loss, survival, and Hurricane Katrina. Self is the owner and CEO of So Stimulus Entertainment and Productions. He has collaborated with influential, influential producers and harnessed their energy to infuse his own art with renewed creativity. His contributions helped reestablish New Orleans on the hip hop map by introducing the next generation of emerging talents. His versatile discography includes R&B, music soundtracks, and blues artists. In his own live performances, Gista is said to have a magnetic stage presence Please welcome Sean Gista Self. Thank you. Hey, nice to meet you guys. Thanks for having me. <sighs> okay, I need to know what your life was like before Hurricane Katrina hit. My life was pretty much, I was doing music. Um, I was very young at the time. Um, actually, when Katrina happened, you know, I had relocated to Atlanta, Georgia. At the time, was very busy in the music, especially in the industry at the time in Atlanta. You know, went to New Orleans. My mom reached out to me. She had <clears throat> this is this is a crazy story. Um, my mom, she was dating a truck driver at the time. They was on the road. They he got sick on the road in Birmingham, Alabama, which is like two hours away from Atlanta, Georgia. So she needed me to come and pick up some things from the truck and go to the house in New Orleans, to her house. Went to New Orleans, that was like a Tuesday, Wednesday passed, Thursday, Friday, they came home. Um, Saturday, you know, it was a beautiful day in New Orleans. I just see everybody boarding up their windows and stuff like that. And mind you, all of the years I grew up in New Orleans, we never ran from a hurricane, mm -hmm. okay? Never ran from a hurricane. We'd get up in sensuals, we'll kind of ride it out. So this was weird. So that Sunday morning, my mom, I stayed out the night before by some friends and um, she called me and said, hey, we, I think we need to really leave. We, went to, we headed west. You know, we couldn't head back east to Georgia because the storm was coming that way. So we headed west to Texas and that ride usually be a five hour ride from New Orleans to Houston. It turned out to be a 24 hour ride that day. Very hectic. One of the most hectic days of my life. And Katrina had them hit Biloxi, Mississippi, mind you, and ripped it apart. I mean, it was it hit at a Category 5. Biloxi, Mississippi was shambles. Well, by the time we got to Texas, which was the next day, I was so exhausted. I just caught a pallet on my uncle floor, and we went by my uncle's house, Carl Marshall. He's my mentor in music. Shout out to Carl Marshall. Um, we went over there. I went to sleep. I passed out immediately. When I woke up, it was like two or three o'clock in the afternoon and I looked at the TV, you know, you wipe your eyes. All you saw was on every channel on the TV was New yeah. Orleans was 80 percent underwater. I'm so happy that I was able to be there with my family to help them get out of that because I had my whole family. We all kind of caravan each other out of there because everybody lost everything. My mom's house was eight feet underwater. My sisters, they had, you know, they stayed upstairs, but the bottom of their stairs was totally underwater. It was, it was a tragic, tragic moment. So being there for my family and being able to, like I said, I moved, I had already moved to Atlanta at the end of 03. So like this happened in 2005. So I was yeah. already in Georgia for like a year prior to Katrina happening. And I was able to be kind of like a help for my family. You know, that's, this is how it changed my life and was able to step up and be the man in the family that I had to be because everybody lost everything. It was getting government assistance and things like that. So it was it was really, really, really terrifying and very life-changing, altering. 
at the moment. Yeah, yeah I remember what, I mean, it was nonstop on all of our TV. Uh, yes. here too. Yeah. And, you know, you, you got family that wind up going to, that didn't leave the city, right? And they went to the Superdome, which was a hellhole. You know, that was a, a, a very scary story, the stuff that, you know, and I, and I still have my telephone number, my 504 area code number that I had 20, you know, I think 20 years, 19 years ago, I still got the same number. So we couldn't call each other. We could only text and mind you, social media, anything like that was around at the time. So yeah. we, we texting, I'm getting texts from good friends and family that was stuck in the Superdome and they're telling me all the devil, the treacherous things that was going on in there. And it was just, it was rough. It was rough. It was a nightmare, you know, people kids, one of my, my partner kids getting saved off the roofs and getting had to get helicopters and stuff like that. People stuck on the roof, people dying, you know, not getting the insulin from the, the diabetes and stuff. You had to hang loved ones on the on the on the on the street post on the corner to kind of identify the bodies and cover them up. It was yeah. just it was some world changing. It was some life changing stuff. It felt like being almost in another life. planet almost it yes it's like the end of the world. Like yeah. it, End of the world was anything close to like disaster. That that would be it, you know, how to describe that. So I mean, it affected me because it affected my my immediate family. You know, mm -hmm. by me getting out of there and you know, I was actually on the verge. I was torn at the time with Bone Thugs and Harmony. Shout out to Bone Thugs and Harmony. They showed me a lot of gratitude and love and stuff and, and brought me along with them along the journey. And we, you know, at the time when it happened, it was just in the middle of everything. And, you know, it was rough. It was very rough. Very, very rough. And and everybody survived? All of my family, my immediate family survived. I did have some other family that passed away, like Lil Tegas. He was 15 years old. He died in the currency of the water. Rest in peace to him. And, you know, a few other people that I know that mm -hmm. did not make it out of that. You know, so wow. and some people died later on after aftermath of it you know so yeah it was rough well surviving it is one thing and then you know the horrific in images are though are so many that we can't get out of our minds but how did you even get through that next day that next month and the next year well just like i said you know when i got back to georgia i had a lot of good friends reached out to me then they kind of you know just the support from the community that helped out, you know, that that reached out to me. They knew, they all was like, always had a love for me and, and they all kind of messed with me on the regular because I was involved with the music business, right? So, you know, I was the guy and everybody just kind of contributed. I had one guy, my one good friend of mine gave me a car because I left my car back in Texas with my family at the time. I just left everything that I had, you know, with them so they could kind of get around the maneuver and kind of get through the, the hard time. but. You know, once I got back to Georgia, I was able to kind of get a little, pick up a little something here and be able to kind of support my family from there. And I think at that time, I think Katrina happened on August 29th of 2005. Yes. Uh, so the holidays kind of gradually hit us and that was hard. That was very, very, very hard, you know, to be this place from your family for the holidays when every holiday you with your family now we all separated we all in different states different places it was very depressing that I can recall and it was it was one of the things that you know we had to kind of fight through till we got better I think when you go through something like that you have to kind of pace yourself and put yourself in the it, it has to be a mental recondition for your mind to try to get back and pick up the pieces so you can you know move forward in, in a situation like that, because when you lose everything and you have no control of what happened, you know, there's no way you could control a natural disaster. No. The and only thing companies did, didn't help either. <laughs> exactly. And then you, you just got to move out the way. You got to, yeah. it's either you're going <clears> to <throat> stay here and try to hold everything together, or you're going to wash your way yeah. with it and you won't survive that. So, and I know if my mom mm -hmm. would have stayed in the house, she wouldn't have survived. She wouldn't have survived it at all. Well. So. Yeah, that was <clears throat> pretty brutal. Yes. Well, and a lot of it's because of the um, uh, geography of New Orleans, too. It's uh, sea level, isn't it? Yes, we are above, we're below sea level. New Orleans yeah. is like a bowl. You know how you got a bowl of cereal? Yeah. 
and you got all the people, the cereals, the people, and you pull the milk in there, and that's that's New Orleans, you know. Um, yeah. And my mom, they stayed by the punch, late puncher train. They stayed off the shore, late puncher train. So that water, and plus it was the lower night war. So where the barges broke at, um, where the levees broke at, and the barge and all that kind of stuff was hit the levees and broke it. That water just flushed out the whole area from Shell Med all the way to the east of New Orleans. It was that, that and that's where my family was living. Yeah. In Everybody might have survived the hurricane itself. It was the flooding that maybe devastated. Maybe. Well, maybe. yeah, the, it was a Cat Five, so it was pretty bad. Yeah, it hit at a Cat Five, and then those <clears> levees the roof closed. off the Superdome. So. Yeah, yeah, that that Category Five was strong. That was one of the strongest. Like I said, we never ran from any hurricane all of my life, and I've been in New Orleans at that point. At, I think what about I'm now. <laughs> Yeah, we never ran from a hurricane. We would just kind of get our essentials, our snacks, our batteries, our flashlights, you know, portable TVs, whatever we had back in those days, and we just ride it out, you know. And what about outside. now? If if you hear something's coming in at a Cat Four, even, <laughs> would you? Yeah, we we'll, we'll ride it out. Would you get the hell out of Dodge? <laughs> we, we, we wrote it out honestly we wrote really? it out you got a category four we wrote it out and you might lose a screen door or something yeah yeah you know, but that's fixable <laughs> but before it's flooding and all that we never experienced that that was something well that was an unusual i mean because of the geography right it's yeah it's, it may not I mean, you're going to get flooding in other places but they're usually higher ground so it's so yeah it's, it's yeah. all all dependent on the sur storm surge so if you back away from the absolutely water, then absolutely okay yeah absolutely but it, it was rough and, and you know we it, you know and us one thing i can say about us from new orleans we survivors yeah. you know we we survive we we get through it we even been through some really really crazy things down there and you know just us as a people we make that city we make new orleans what it is we full of culture you know and um, the mus music is such an integral part of it too so i imagine how has music helped people, you know, get through these, through it and, um, and carry on? At that point. Well, the football team certainly did. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, our football team, we we struggled through that. The Saints struggled through that, too, because we had yeah. to move San Antonio to, you know, the Superdome was tarnished. Um, it was really rough. It was bad, bad. You know, I'm a spiritual guy, so it was a lot of bad spiritual things going on in that Superdome at, yes, this, at this particular event, you know, um, but you as far as the music, like me, I was kind of like able to have, I was still in it, but I wasn't in it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I didn't necessarily lose all of my stuff, like my studio equipment and stuff like that. The only thing I lost in Katrina was a pair of shorts and, box of, and boxes and stuff <laughs> that I had a pantry to wash by my mama's house, wow. you know, but other than <laughs> I already had moved away, yeah. so I kind of secured my my music and stuff, and I didn't lose none of that. So thank God for that. But I had to pick up, and I had to. My my thing was when I when that happened, I was like, I have to make this music stuff work. Yeah. I have to get this, you know, because I got to support my family now. You know, it's so much redemption, and it and it makes your heart, you know, it's heavy on your heart. When you, and Atlanta, Atlanta is a good city for your genre too, because absolutely, isn't absolutely. that the first place? Yes, and like I said, my roots was like we had one of the biggest studios in New Orleans throughout the years. You know, my uncle did, and even with that, you know, he had left ahead of the time. He moved to Meridian, Mississippi, before Katrina hit too. So we all kind of got out of Dodge to kind of start bringing our music to other different places at the moment because we already had made this huge huge mark in new orleans and we was more of like the cornerstone you know of the musicians right. that came by to the studio and like my whole upbringing was i grew up around live musicians i grew up around yeah real your un uncle introduced you to the business early didn't he yes very early shout out to him he's been such a blessing to me um he's he's so he was my dad in that area we look alike too <laughs> everybody thought that was my biological dad but he was the man he you know he gave so many people a shot and they all became successful in the music mm -hmm. business everybody took off and started doing their thing and finding their way in it and it just so happened I, I was the one that kind of 
was under him, I was always the kid. And I was always around all of the big musicians and putting music together at such a young age. And really, really advanced for my age. It was like, yo, this kid is going to be something serious. And they show us they, from their mouth to God's ears. Yeah, I am, you know, uh, did a lot of great things with it. And my uncle, he he was very, very intricate about me being a part of this music business because he had came at me like, hey, you know, you either going to get serious with this or you're going to get from around me. And I knew what was on the other side of that yeah. door. It was nothing but drugs, you know. And uh, when you brought up in an environment, like, I, I, I get it because, you know, it's easy. All you have to do is pick the wrong friends, you know. They was automatically your friends, if, if you look at it, because these people that you grew up with, they just, their lives turned out somewhere different. And mm -hmm. you just so happen to have this particular family member who have something to offer you that could keep you. Music always been my my refuge. You know what I'm saying? I always mm -hmm. have music I to do. run away to from the troubles that if I went home, you know, going home, like coming home from the studio and my house is, you know, got drug addicts in my house and getting high and yeah. all kind of stuff. It's just a, it's a really dark, dark story. You know what I'm saying? I don't want to get too deep into it, yeah, but just I know. know. I know. I survived it, and yeah. music was a main reason. Thank God, right? Thank God for that Humbly. uncle that introduced you to that, because, I mean, otherwise, you don't Who know. Knows? We went in this conversation to be totally different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's easy to get uh, rebellious, and, you know, even if you have the, the poster home, it's never perfect, so there's always something that will make you rebel. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely absolutely and even even though you know I, I, was I survived, I um, <laughs> right yeah i even though i survived a lot of it i still like i said you know i guess gista came from those elements yeah. of what i was coming up from because all of my friends and then i always made i think everybody referred to my tracks my music my production is gangster because my beats was yeah. hard you know what i mean it was yeah. hardcore beats and it was concrete beats and it made everybody excited. So they kind of like, I got to get me a Gista beat. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> that actually so, sounds pretty damn badass. So the, yeah, yeah. So, a Gista beat. I think you better yeah. coin that phrase. <laughs> hey, hey, that's one of my email addresses. <laughs> right on, right on. So yeah, so it, it was cool. It was cool. So what came first, the performing or the producing? Uh, but, but I think uh producing i want to say producing um i always rap i always rapped even as a kid i remember writing like this is black history month you know so I yes it is we to, right so i remember you had to be in school and we had to come up with you know uh had they made a group at school and i had i wrote my whole group rhymes everybody rap you know and i always was advanced rapping i used to rap on the schoolyard and battle dudes and rapping and always had a flow I always knew how to rap just something that I got honestly because I grew up as a hip-hop kid you know my sister shout out to my older sister Delanda she the one who really 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 instilled hip-hop in me as a really really little kid I remember she was you know she's like in that generation in the 80s when 80s hip-hop was really I think the first record I heard was Lottie Dottie by Dougie mm -hmm. Fresh and Stick Rick. And that was one of her favorite songs. And she played it all day long and every day. And she just turned me on to all of these different rappers back in those times. So I fell in love with it. I got really, really acquainted with it. And I, I just learned how to rap. But when I got in the studio with my uncle and started making beats, he gave me a beat machine at seven years old. He never ran me away from it. Sometimes you, you know, your, your relative will come with something like a really expensive beat machine or something, and you're a kid just messing around with it, and instead of saying, hey, leave that alone, he was like, you like that, huh? You like that, huh? And he gave it to me more, So one day he gave it to me, you know, and, and he, he really got me into it. So when I got around him, you know, production, I started learning how to use the big stuff that they was using at the time, and I, I was always like a kid that liked computers and stuff like that, so I found it as like, this thing like a computer or something or a video game. So I learned how to make it, understood the production, mm -hmm. the method of it, got tutorage from a lot of great producers that was around in the studio facility at the time. And 
I just learned. I picked it up very, very young, and I was very advanced, very advanced. Those early days, rap was kind of considered a fad in a way, like from the mainstream, not necessarily yes. in, in that yes. genre. <clears throat> but I think, like, being in Canada, I'm not exposed to everything. But um, Public Enemy was the first actual rap band I recall seeing mainstream anyway um there may have been others but that's the that's the first one i recall but that's very rare even, even now like even just recently wasn't eminem given a, a a music hall of fame award yeah even now you know even up until that point that industry seems to have been like ostracized and taken like as a fad right it's yeah it's like a 30 40 50 year fad <laughs> that's what we just made the hip-hop 50 years we just made 50 years of hip-hop last right. year right that's right um you know as you can see hey nothing sell without it you can't market anything without hip-hop today you know yeah it's now it's like the last everywhere. 20 years so that lets let you know that some things that's like, you know, hip hop, this thing is, 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 is a very, very, very strong, strong genre of music. Simple as it is, it's still strong because we have the most influential um, music that, that comes from this. And, you know, and it goes back to like the stuff that like with Hurricane Katrina and being a survivor for Hurricane Katrina, who wouldn't want to rap about that? Who want to, want to hear that from somebody like myself or any of my fellow colleagues from New Orleans that's that's putting it down that survived that. You know what I'm saying? If you're an artist, how can you not reflect on the times? As simple as that. So my thing is I like to talk about what's going on at the current time. And yeah. that's, that's what it's all about. And, and to go back to your point of Public Enemy and shout out to Public Enemy. I was able to chop it up and meet Chuck D and have a have a beautiful, beautiful moment with him. And I love Chuck and I'm looking forward to working with him in the future. But um they always reflected on the times. They always reflected on the realities of even in America. I know you in Canada, but in America, you know, we have a lot of diversities and a lot of challenges that we had to come up with within yeah. our culture. You know what I'm saying? And Chuck D and Public Enemy Flav and all of those guys they was one of those those forces that put hip hop on a political map, on a conscious rap level, where people in, like yourself and in, in Canada and across the world can relate to, you know what I mean, and see it, and that it was a movement. So and then Aerosmith even kicked it off further when they did their duo. Yes, with Run DMC. They did that with Run DMC. Cross genre, like phenomenal, phenomenal, and you know these are the things that make hip hop. That that and and grounded hip hop in in to stay, you know, doing those things and and when you contribute that when you contribute you can put hip hop with anything anything you can put it with country you can put it with rock and roll you can put it South with South Asian music infused with hip hop amazing <laughs> amazing you gotta you still you gotta put a little sprinkle of hip hop in there man yeah. you got to yeah. play, that's for sure. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> No, but um, the music industry itself, it can eat you up and spit you right out. So, yes. How do you stay grounded in an industry like this that is, you know, just, well, like entertainment cutthroat as well? <laughs> <laughs> no, I can tell you my method, my personal method, stay independent. <laughs> Stay independent and stay true to what you want to deliver to your audience. It's sometimes, you know, it's a it's a saying that says it may take me a little longer, but I'm not going to sell. I'm not going to take the shortcut because when you do take the shortcut. Right. And what I mean by taking the shortcut is going to take that deal that's not necessarily in your favor. You know, go and take that particular deal that's going to enable you to broaden out and spread your wings you only seclude and me personally as a as a person is not just g star sean as a man i don't like to be put in a box yeah. so i don't do good being put in one box I, I, i'm gonna burst out eventually 
So I don't like to be put in the box. So my thing is I stay grounded by staying independent and staying in full control of my destination. Like I said, it may take me a little bit longer because I've been doing this now, thinking about it. I just did a calculation on my career. I've been doing this for 32 years, you know, technically. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm just counting all of that as a kid from, from, from when I first started working on production to now. And I've been doing this for a long time. And I had a few opportunities to take a, take the shortcut, but I said, nah, because it didn't feel right. I, I'm going to go by my feeling. And if it feels good, I'll go with it. But if it don't feel right, I'm not going to do it. And that's just my natural instinct. You know what I'm saying? But um, yeah, it's like people signing a publishing deal for a book publishing deal. You can sign with the big publisher, but you know, it's not going to be what you think it is. <laughs> it's not going to be your And favorite. you don't have control over your copyright. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's one thing that I'm going to tell you. You lose it. You actually sign it away. And then next thing you know, you don't own shit. <laughs> right. And you, it's like you take that little money up front because they, they probably offer you a nice little bit of money, you know. Yep. But up just front. imagine what you can make on the residuals of it down the line as it, as it goes if you're fully in control of it and it's tough they make it they try to make it tough for you but you got to come up with ways to 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 beat the, the must of the madness you know what i'm saying you mm -hmm. got to find ways to to make it all work for you and that's my thing that's my that's be that be my actual spill to a lot of up-and-coming artists that comes to me and asks for advice you know they i don't want to sign you but if i do decide to do something with you i'm going to do it for the short term to get you kind of get your room, start the lawnmower up and get you going. But after that, you're on your own, you know, yeah. take heed to what you have to do, you know. Um, well, come on now. If Ken Le Ken Kendrick Lamar came on your doorstep, mm -hmm. you'd keep him. <laughs> no, not necessarily. Not necessarily. You know why? Because I want Kendrick, especially artists like him, he's bigger than that. He's he's like me. Yeah, I feel like I me and him are the same. We, we can't be put in a box. You know what I mean? You can't put me in a box. And I wouldn't definitely, if I know an artist like him, I wouldn't try to put him in a box. But if I know he had what it takes and I know he got the ingredients to get the, the ball rolling, I'm going to endorse him. If I'm in a position to endorse him, I'm going to endorse him and get him going. And then I'll be in the wing, let him do his thing. And if he ever needed me again, if I have to collaborate with him or come, come together like Voltron, somebody, you know what I'm saying? We could do that and make it, make it a powerful move. But Nine times out of 10, I'm going to try to just endorse people and I don't want them to be stuck up under me as no artist or anything like yeah. that. We do business. That's, we that's do business. respect. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. I, I, that's that's how I got it. God, God actually put me in the path of some very, very legendary guys that, that took me in and showed me the game, gave me the, the business and showed me how to do it. They saw what I was doing already because when I came to them, I was already season i was already moving and they said well you just need this and like for instance like lazy bone shout out to lazy bone for bone thugs and harmony me and him are like brothers and he came to me one day he's like hey man you know i just they just signed with switch beats at the time so we had the endoscopes deal and he's like yeah we're gonna do this and we're gonna put out your album and do this and that and i'm like i stopped him i said hey man You know, I want to sign like that. You know, I don't want to ride off your coattail like that. The best thing you can do for me is just let me go on tour with you guys. So let me open up for you guys. Mm, yeah. And, you know, and let me build my brand like that. He got him upset. He was like, man, I ain't trying to, blah, blah, blah. you know, he gave me a little pushback on it. But then he was like, gave me the plan and we rolled with it, you know, and he respected where I was coming from. And now we have albums together that um, is not signed under him, but it's, it's like two generals, you know, two bosses. We got a so stimulus. Mo Thugs records collaboration and Harmony House collaboration. And now we got records together. We toured, I toured a lot with them and was in, involved with a lot of good moments with them and stuff and was a part of a lot of good, great mm -hmm. moments with them and got, you know, introduced to Switch Beats, was able to work with them and work with this one, that one and meeting this one and that one and all of these great artists and stuff. And not only that, but I was able to do my own thing too because I'm always was, you know, outside of them, I was already, you know, connected with Dougie Fresh and, you know, all of these legendary artists that I knew. So it was, it was, it was good. I, I always try to make my own way. I always try to make my own way. 
What's <clears throat> how tedious is the studio production process? It's a process because people see the end result, but right. you watch the the series Empire, it shows you a little <laughs> bit about production, but really, it doesn't show you all of it. <laughs> it's a process. Let me say that. It's just like if you was to go to work and get paid on the clock, you know what I'm saying? And you had to put together this particular product or whatever merchandise you're working on. It's the same, same analysis. It's a process. You got to know um, what you're listening for. <clears throat> you got to know what you're aiming for. Um, you got to take your time because your ears is, the ears don't lie. Like for instance, like when I create, I do my music, I do my production first. I make sure that I get it how I want it for as arranging it, composing it, songing it out, making sure everything, I want the verse to come in here, I want the hook to come in here, I want the break to come in here, then I want to come back with another verse here. You have to arrange it and make sure that you got it all structured out. And then you got to do it, it's called pre-production. So when you do the pre-production, you're pretty much laying out the whole track on tracks. All right, so the first track might be a kick drum. Your second track might be a snare drum. Your third might, track might be a hi-hat. The fourth track might be a bass line and so on and so forth. So you're laying all these tracks out and you're listening for a mix. You want to mix it down. And that's where the process comes into play. Because when you're mixing, I like to mix with four, five, six different ears in the room because everybody is going to hear it different. I could even say, hey, you you know, can you come and sit in my session and let me know what you hear? You might be like, well, hey, that bass sound a little little distorted over there. That, that I had sound a little too high. Can you turn it down a little bit? And, you know, but it'd be honest ears, right? Even with yeah. your ears, it could be honest ears that hear it. And it's a process. It's, it's a job. Yeah. So you don't just rely on your own ear. And uh... I don't. I don't. Yeah. I don't like to. I like to have multiple, especially trusted ears that know what we all listening for professionals, you know, like my homie Drago, shout out to Drago's, my DJ Black Nificent, he's another one that I started out with from day one. Um, we all we all share these type of moments. My, my partner Trav, you know, he's a brand, he's my branding guru, but he's definitely got an ear for, for mixing and stuff, and that's the most tedious part about making records. Yeah. Because because the average ear won't hear what we hear, right? Right. Oh, so you like like even with like a, a, a like a, a Kendrick Lamar, you know Kendrick Lamar, he may make his production, and we all might hear something different. But the average ear, they don't care about the bass being too big or the 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 sounds. They don't care about that. They just care about a good beat and good lyrics. But we listen to for the sound of how because the how, rest how, of it kind of like it's a symphony, right? It's all of that. Everything together and uh yeah everything you know everything it all eventually when you when it's all put together and it's all come together it all just blends together and that's when you hear the magnificent sound but that's that separates everything but is it like being a writer where you can actually edit it to death and <laughs> when do you know when to stop <laughs> um it's all about how you feel about it okay I my my method is simplicity sells. So keep it simple. You know what I mean? Keep it simple because you don't want it to go over the average audience ear or over their head. You know what I mean? You want right. people to catch it. You want them to catch it right off the bat. And people catch what they can understand. If they don't understand, they got a symphony going on over here, you got horns going on over there, you got drums over here. They might not catch all of that. But if you take it and you just have the symphony playing with the drum beat. Then you take the symphony out and you put the horns on with the drum beat and you, you and then you blend it in and you blend it out and edit it, then you know it makes more sense that way. Yeah. Simplicity. Simplicity sells. So the equipment is crazy expensive, I imagine. How often do you have to upgrade it? I I upgrade mine uh probably every year. Oh every wow. Year. I'm in my studio right now, matter of fact. So cool. I got everything here. Um and then everything is that and I, often you have to upgrade it every year. Yeah, something like that. It depends on what they come out with because they all got different things that comes out, different pieces that come out, different softwares. You know, the computers like Technology. you got a mind. <laughs> I come from the era 
of the real, the real tape, of the analog sound. So it wasn't too much uh, upgrading at that moment, you know, because the analog you had, it was analog. That ad that, that adaptation must have been a hell of a thing to go through. Yeah, I, like like I said, I come from the era where I had, I come from the, the old school era with my uncle had the, the rail to rails. And, and all of a sudden you got to learn computer software programming. Exactly. <laughs> I was there when the first computer we had the first computers. I'm looking at it like, oh, we this is this look exciting, but how what do I, what the hell do I start at? You know? Right. <laughs> but eventually I wound up getting on the computers like like honestly, I started making production in 91. I was a kid, okay? And by 90, I wouldn't want to say 96, 97 is that's when the well actually 95 is when the computers we had cakewalk. I didn't know nothing about cakewalk, anything. <laughs> a lot of producers and a lot of engineers that hear me say this, they're gonna attest to this because if they was out around then, they'll tell you, they'll be like, Yeah, I know he knows what he's talking about. <laughs> but cakewalk was the first computer software that I was introduced to. Then it came sessions. Sessions I did my first solo album on. Back in 97, I did a whole album on Sessions. It had the surround sound. It gave you this crazy different, good technical sound that I was doing my beats and the old boys that I grew up on. So I would dump my tracks in there, do my vocals, you know, get artists to come by, sing on the tracks, whatever, I, however I arranged it. And then next thing you know, 98 came, they go Pro Tools. Now Pro Tools is the go-to gear that everybody uses in the music industry right now. It's like music industry standard when it comes to Pro Tools. But now it's so much stuff out there now. Like I got like six or seven different ways I can record in this one room. But I choose to use my one board. It got more, it's digital, but it's 24 bit, mm -hmm. but it still got the analog feel. Like I could touch the knobs and mm -hmm. go up and down with the mixes and stuff like that. Like I'm used to, like I'm used to from the old school because that's the yeah. warmest you want to get it. You know what I mean? So it's a process. It's a big process. And what does it mean to create uh, your own culture through sound? I mean, I imagine that also helps you choose which artists you want to work with. But mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is there a way to describe that? That's a good question. It's a really good question. Um, because we know that there's different sounds for different cultures. And yes. Yeah. Yeah. But how do we describe it? <laughs> well, it depends on what you what you're aiming for. Like my thing, like the album I'm working on right now, right? It's called Classic Status. And actually the, the single is out right now, it's doing amazing. Um I actually did uh, a joint for dedicated to the hip hop 50th anniversary. And what I did with this particular record, I brought it back to the essence of the hip hop sound. I brought it back to more, you're gonna, it's gonna remind you of the early 80s, the mid 80s, the mid 90s sound, right in, in between. When I, when I produced that record, I wanted to capture this particular essence from like the MC and the DJ point of view. Uh, uh, Cause you gotta look at what hip hop has evolved into since that time to 2024. We don't have the essence of a lot of elements of the original origins of our culture is not being celebrated anymore. You know what I mean? It is, but it ain't. I mean, let me say it that way. Um, Cause the younger artists that's coming up under us, they kind of picking up from the wave of what's going on right now, not knowing that's not what it really, really is. In other words, what we're doing in hip hop is already has been done before. Even, even back in the beginning stages of hip hop, what they pull from the stuff that came from the 60s and the, the jazz bands, we pull from a lot of a lot of East Coast rappers and when they produce records, they pull from a lot of jazz records and predominant jazz records and stuff like that, like Tribe Called Quest, Q-Tip, shout out to Q-Tip and Tribe Called Quest and rest in peace to Fife Dog. Um, they, those guys, they pull, and not just them, but a lot of different producers, they pull from, they sample, you know what I mean? It was called sampling. And I still sample to this day. That's hip hop. You know what I mean? When you got to go in the crates and you going through the crates and you 
listening to old records and you listen to old riffs and like, ooh, I like that. And you take that and you dump it into your beat machine or whatever you composing on and you take it and loop it and you put a drum beat behind it and you catch a vibe to it, then you got something. That's the sensation of, you know, creating for that, that your culture. So it's, it's, it's very, it's a very tedious process. Yeah. But it's magical. It, it's, that's the best I was because it's, it's so much that go with it. You know, so much that go into it. You yeah. Know? And I really encourage people to listen. You know, you may have a specific genre that you focus on. Like right. you know, the older you are, the more expansive your taste. Absolutely. There but you even go. when you're young, I, although I'm meeting more younger people who are more expansive and know a lot of the older artists, but yeah. um, like if you don't know who Elvis Presley is, there, there's no hope for you at all. But <laughs> people don't know. I think every single genre of music stems from his music. <laughs> a lot of it does, and but you got to look at what Elvis pulled from, right? Yeah. Elvis pulled from yeah. a lot of a lot of uh, a rhythm and blues that come up in the South that you know. That our our people did, you know what and I'm saying? You love music, you got to kind of find. I mean, you don't necessarily have to like everything, but it's kind of nice to know. Okay, well, this is what Tijano sounds like. This is what you know, uh, right, right. Atlantic or or uh, Newfoundland music sounds like. It's, right, it's all different, I you, right? I, I I've been listening to. I, I fell in love with, uh, and I did so many. I, I listened to everything. Let me just say that I listened to every genre of music. I, my my discography, my 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 musical library, I have almost a million songs in my library. All of them is not all rap. I'm gonna tell you that right now. Yeah, I got, yeah. I got everybody from A C D C to Two Chankers. Yes. <laughs> Put it that way, right? So even some um, country. <laughs> yeah, a little country there too, because I was actually I got I never liked it. Like I'm never gonna say I never was a fan of country music until I was able to DJ this gig in, in Houston, Texas, where I was DJing at a country club. And they had a lot of country music that there was on and I had to play. And I had to yeah. learn music and learn country music. And I, and I started listening to it. I'm like, you know what? This is not bad because the lyrics that, that came. Yeah, that the came, lyrics are very, in, you know. It's very, very, very it's like. storytelling, right? It's yeah, it's storytelling. Story. Exactly, exactly. So I, I learned a lot. You know, I'm I'm an open book when it comes to music. Like I, yeah. I just fell in love with Brazilian funk. I got oh, yeah. I love Brazilian music. I love I love it's, it's like I done pulled from it for some of my records and stuff like that, and I use it and I made hip hop out of it. It's funky. It's, it's and Mexican music. I love Mexican music. I love Mexican music too. It's it's a lot of music that I love. But it, especially when you kind of infuse two yeah. or three of them together, right? It kind of yeah. brings out a very cool sound. And just getting that vibe from different genres of music, it separates you. Like reggae music is my ultimate go-to vibe. I love reggae music. Um, Still Pulse is my favorite reggae band of all time. But of course, Bob Marley is the guy. Yeah, um, he is. <laughs> he is amazing. I actually went to Jamaica last a year or two ago. Oh, wow. was able to do the excursion and I went and visited his whole area and actually walked around his tombstone and with a candle and it was very sacred and I was just it was just like an awe for me you know um music is what he did what he did for the world and, and how he went about doing it it reminds me a lot of what I what I'm on you know what I'm saying and yeah. I, I I took a lot of that and instilled it in myself I think I pulled from all of the greats and it well, that's good. Yeah. That's great. I think that's what also it makes it more fun. And, Absolutely. And you know, it, the creativity, right? If you don't have creativity, uh, it gets boring. <laughs> right. right. Plus, you have it's to keep fun. re like music evolves so much. You have to kind of keep keep reinventing with yourself, it, right? You Got to reinvent yourself, and that's like that's where I'm at right now with what I'm doing with this new album and stuff. I, I want to have a new different look. I want to have a new different type of thing. Like the music that I'm putting out right now, like I, the, the aim with this album is I want to make sure it's, it's, it's based around the classic hip hop era origins of where we come from with it. And I want to bring that back because we got so far away from it. It's not fun anymore listening to 
a lot of artists that's coming out yeah. and younger artists. It's, it's just not funny anymore because it's very predictable. We already know what you're going to say. We already know <laughs> everybody talking about the same thing and all you guys beats are the same way. It's nothing exciting about the tracks that you're rapping on or none of that. So rap is, is actually to me, it's like on a decline. So I say the most high put me in this position and he sent me on this mission to restore the origins of what it's supposed to be like. And some people I might catch like for and they say, hey, you sound old or you sound too <laughs> this, but I don't care, you know, because what I'm gonna do, I'm already in a modern day, I'm in 24. I know what y'all doing, what y'all doing, I could do in my eyes closed, but I like to make it worthwhile. I like to make it not saying necessarily see a challenge, but I like to be more creative in the process and make give you more to look forward to. And that's why I get my, my strength from, with that. Yeah. And so you once said, um, I might have heard this on a podcast. If you tell the kids long enough that they're going to be great, they're going to be great. So do you have an example of this for yourself or yes. for somebody that you've worked with? Yes, I do. I do. I do. I'm a firm believer in, you know, you speak things into existence because I know I have spoke things into existence. Um, I watch a lot of people speak their demise, and especially in hip hop. I've seen a lot of people that say, you know, well, I don't feel like I'm good enough or I'm, I'm just not this and I'm just not that and they lose. I've seen some people that don't have the necessary, don't have the, the skill requirements that like maybe this person do that don't have the confidence, but they got the confidence in what they're doing, but they just don't have the skills, but they spoke themselves to greatness so much so they evolve into this great, great, great source. You know what I'm saying? Um, once again, that, that phrase, I remember that. You tell a kid as he coming up, you know, Johnny, you're going to be great. You just got to speak it into him. You know, Johnny, you're going to be great. You know, you're going to be awesome. Eventually, Johnny is going to start believing that because Johnny is going to be faced with different adversities in life that's going to challenge him. And if he don't feel like he could get past his challenge, that he's not good enough to get past his challenge, he's not. But if you tell that kid, you know what, kid, you ain't going to be shit. You're just not going to, you know, you just ain't got it. You know, that kid going to give up. And he, he don't have the confidence now. I'm a little total opposite because I grew up in a situation where I was told I wasn't going to exceed to be anything or I, I wasn't good enough or this, that, and other. I use that as ammunition because yeah. I knew deep inside that somebody told me prior to them telling me that bull crap that I was great, that I'm going to be great. And they told me this at a young age. So I already instilled, that was already instilled in me. You know what I'm saying? That. I was going to be great because they told me, my uncle used to tell me, hey, you're going to be good if, if you just da 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 and sharpen this up and you need to learn how to play an instrument and blah, 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 blah. But you're good. You, you're going to be all right. Every 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 challenge that he threw at me, I was able to stand up to the occasion and, and, and rise to the occasion. But the average kid, they don't have that because all of their life from as a infant child, they told it was told it wasn't going to be nothing. It wasn't going to be shit. If I'm not nothing, you ain't going to be nothing. These are the things that happens in our households and our community, you know, especially with us, you know what I mean? Um, and sometimes it's not direct. It's just kind of like inferred. Yeah. It, 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 you know, cause, cause a lot of parents are lost. A lot of parents made mistakes in life and they kind of put that on their kids because of the mistakes they made. Life is a trip. You know, life is one, one big trip and, and, is what you pull out of it is what's going to determine your 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 determination. I was determined to be great. I I I I choose to say, you know what, f you. I'm going to exceed this. I take that as fire. You know what I mean? People that was jealous or people that didn't understand my my passion or my purpose, I was able to exceed through that and not let that get me down. You know what I mean? I always wanted to be on top of what I was supposed to do and, and do what I was supposed to do. But I'm not going to let nobody deter me from my greatness. And because I was told from day one that I was going to be good at this and I was going to be great at this. So 
I try to spread that same energy to those who I, I you know, embrace and stuff like that, you know. That was good. So what's next on your plate? What what have you got in the queue? Classic status, the album, rolling out now. Got the second video coming up. Uh, I win. Listen to that, right? Got a record called I Win. Um, big inspirational record. Um, uh, got the, I'm going to shoot the video here in Vegas. Going to show the nightlife, Vegas Strip, and all that flashy. So it's going to be a little bit different from what I got. Um, excited about the album. I'm rolling out the album. The album is coming together really, really good. I'm pretty like... I'm a high percentage, like 90% done with it. That tedious process we spoke on earlier about mixing down, I got to go through that with it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm kind of gearing up for that. Um, I'm just trying to make sure I record everything and get everything on tracks that I want to have on there before I start that process. But the album, um, I got another album that I'm planning on putting out at the end toward the end of the year called The Insurrection, January 6th. It's more going to be politically charged about, you know, the politicians. And stuff. I actually started this album two years ago. I, I started this album and I got the album cover and everything done. All of the stuff is done already. I was ready to pull the trigger on it, but I just couldn't get the support from the teams that I mm -hmm. needed at the time because they were scared to touch it because it was touch a, such Probably a... Probably not now. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. But now I'm like, you no, know, we what? really need it, probably. <laughs> you need it, you need it. And my thing about this is that this this album is that um, it's not necessarily addressing the left wingers or the right wingers or anything like that, right? It's necessary. It's really just trying to bring everybody together. Yeah. Yeah, just like what they did. did, it's like seeing what they did in that particular moment, you know, overthrowing the, the government and storming the, the Capitol with the state Capitol building and all that kind of stuff. We saw that. We saw that in real time, right? Yeah, we did. And the the biggest the, the biggest thing, like I told, you know, like I would say is that this is not a battle for the, the Black America. You know, this is not necessary a battle. This is not our fight. This is a fight for Our left life. wingers and right wingers and stuff, right wingers, really. Um, we have to understand the the mad the method to this madness. What it was is that everybody came together and said, Oh no, you're not gonna ever stuff, you're not gonna overthrow us, you know, you're not gonna just take the the, the our president and throw him. A, no, we're not gonna let you do that. So we're gonna Blah, 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 blah. And pretty much they could say, you know, number 45, he incited it or whatever, whatever, and this, that, and other. But I look at this togetherness and how people came together. So what if we, us, Blacks, Caucasians, Asians, Hispanics, you know, Brazilians, everybody, everybody came together and said, we're not going to let y'all dictate or, or, or do anything against our human dignity. And we're going to overthrow y'all bullshit. You know what I mean? <laughs> we're going to yeah. come together because all of us to come together in the world. Break the world, yeah. First of all, we have to understand that we have to learn from each other. We need to take the time to analyze what we all, what our strengths and our weaknesses are as, as, as a whole. And if we could come together and do this as a whole, we could be very, very strong. This world would be a way better place. No. But it's wishful thinking. It's just wishful thinking. I and love that. <laughs> it is I, not wishful I thinking. I think that, I think there is a movement towards that direction, to tell you the truth. I want to be a part of that. I mean, yeah. I want to incite that. If that, if I could, for my, for my end, I am. I'm going to do it. I'm going to put it out there. I'm going to put together in, you know, come on now, this is rap, this is hip hop, right? And, you know, like you, you mentioned Public Enemy, I think this is something that Public Enemy was on the verge of doing, you yeah. know, at the time, when, were. At the time, at that time, in the 80s, when they was coming out. And it know, was, yeah, the 80s was, had its own uh, mess. <laughs> yeah, there was all kind of stuff that was going yeah. on at that time. So now let's fast forward to these times. And what we need to do now, we have more outlets and we may have more platforms to really get our message across versus what Chuck and them had back in those times. We got social media, we got, you know, different sites, we got 
Locker Room Growth Podcast. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> we got all of these different platforms that we could get these messages out that really could, you know, could reach everybody with with, with the flick of a one 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 flick. You know what I mean? And, yeah. and I think that's where it's going to really be powerful. And that's what we have to utilize these outlets and utilize these resources to get these type of things about. So, because if we could, if we could bounce off each other and get understand and not overthrow each other and understand where we're coming from and where we're going yeah i think that we can you know and overthrow the bullshit that we don't agree with you know a human human dignity i'm not talking about black white human dignity because at the end of the day you cut us all we all bleed what blood exactly. we all bleed red you know what i mean so it doesn't matter we all have to understand that we are human beings and we we all we breathe the same air. We, we we live the same way. You know what I mean? And, and we, we just I'm, need to... I'm all in. <laughs> I'll be back before when the album come out, we'll talk about it in more detail. Therefore, I have the music and you can listen to it. And you'll, you'll study and analyze and then see, okay, this guy is really, he's really on this thing. And let's, you know, who say? Like I said, it's, it's wishful thanks for, it's, it's, it's wishful thanking for me, but it's Who the knows? process that's ha like, uh, um, you know, I think you should pursue it. I don't think it's wishful thinking. I think it's just part of that process. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Actually, to be honest with you, actually, I got seven records already done for it. So cool. I'm already knee deep in it. You know, it's just Good. a matter of time. <laughs> <laughs> everything about music and everything about this stuff is about timing. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Classic and that stuff. is part of the evolving of music too, right? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Like, like even with this classic status album, um, I have been working on this album for a few years. You know, I had stopped. I put out mixtapes and other albums in the process of even working on this album. But when this hip hop fifty year came about, and I had that one record sitting in my vault, and I'm like, this record is done, and this record goes perfect. What was what the movement is right now, and when I put it out, everybody loved the record. Like we over a million views of the video on World Star Hip Hop. I got over a hundred thousand some streams on Spotify with it. You know, uh, all of the DJs, everybody across the country in the United States, across the world. Let me say that across the world, they supported the record. The record is flaming hot right now. So. Right on. Right I, I I think that the timing of it was 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 really 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 spot on. So we we made it work. We made it work. Thank you so much for coming on my show. <laughs> so great oh, to have you. Happy. Thanks for having me so much. It was so great talking to you. Thank you. This is Debbie Ellickson. Thank you to my guest and to you, the viewer, for watching this episode of Locker Room for Growth. Please subscribe to this channel and check out our past shows and clips in the YouTube playlist. The show broadcasts from Treaty 7 on Turtle Island, the traditional territory of the Blackfoot people, which includes Siksida, Blood, Pikani, Sutina, Stony Nakoda Nations, and Métis Nation Region 3. Again, thank you for watching and please subscribe.